My second book devoted to Orwell's life, work, and legacy. Scenes from an Afterlife, The Legacy of George Orwell. It was published during his centennial year in 2003. That is to say, between the time of my first study of Orwell, which was completed in the late 1980s, almost 15 years transpired before I returned to look at Orwell closely. In a way, I profited immensely from what Arnold Toynbee, the historian, speaks of as withdrawal and return. Having withdrawn from Orwell and channeled my energies into other intellectual interests, among them British literature, Latin American politics and culture, human rights, above all, East German socialism and German politics and culture in the Nazi era and Stalinist era. I returned refreshed to Orwell in 2003. The only other attention I had given to his work was to write and edit a book devoted exclusively to animal farm designed for high school students entitled Animal Farm in Historical Context, published in 1999. But aside from that, and a new introduction to a second edition of The Politics of Literary Reputation, I had moved my interests elsewhere. It was only that I saw the wellspring of interest that was developing in Orwell as his centenary year approached that I thought a book that would take the story beyond 1989 and discuss his posthumous literary reputation across the entire last half of the 20th century would be valuable. And this is how Scenes from an Afterlife, The Legacy of George Orwell, emerged. I continued to be keenly interested in his reputation. However, I shifted slightly the metaphorical vocabulary in which I discussed reputation as my thinking evolved. That is, in the politics of literary reputation, I talk about the Orwell Portrait Gallery. That is, constructing a vocabulary based both in cosmology and in art history, where I describe Orwell's faces, the portraiture of the rebel, the common man, the prophet, the saint, and all of the derivations, the cluster of words, of watchwords, that orbited around those central stars. In the case of rebel, for instance, individualist, iconoclast, such and such. Noticing the appearance of those words and how they became linked to rebel or revolutionary or on and on had helped me construct a full facial portrait and also to discuss not only the making of that portrait but its claiming and counterclaiming, what I refer to as the defacement of Orwell. 
However, in scenes from an afterlife, I took all this one step further. It is not just a portrait gallery, which suggests something of the static nature of Oral's reputation, but a motion picture gallery. Not just a transcript or a play script, but a shooting script showing the transformations of Orwell's reputation in a dramatic, indeed cinematic fashion, Orwell on the telescreen. It was this kind of vitalistic approach to reputation that I wanted to capture as I looked at new scenes of his reputation. And so Scenes from an Afterlife examines his legacy via 17 reception scenes. It was again an attempt to write reception history as located within cultural, intellectual, and social history. And it's an attempt to look not just at reception that is impressionistic reviews and statements made about Orwell, but to look at reputation, the systematic codification of reception materials into stages, movements, rubricated gallery scenes that could be encapsulated in a phrase and open to generalization about how reputation gets formed. And so I continue to have my scenic approach to Orwell's history, but now lent it a much more dynamic dimension. All of this coincided with what I described as the third high watermark of Orwell's posthumous reputation history. From the 1950s to the mid-1980s, now to 2003. Scenes from an afterlife. The legacy of George Orwell. Yes, Professor Ron, I want to get a thank you here. Um, it seems to me that although this was already clear in your first major book on Orwell, The Politics of Literary Reputation, that with this book it now becomes fully revealed that you are a cultural historian and not just a literary scholar. Would you agree with, agree with that question? Thank you, yes. You know, I. I wanted to be not just a literary critic or exegete interpreting Orwell's work or even evaluating it, but an intellectual and cultural historian of Anglo-American and European history showing the place of Orwell's reception history within wider cultural and intellectual history. In fact, Another theoretical contribution that I hoped to make to literary studies was to reinvest literary studies with an historical dimension. Not in the way the new historicists were doing it, such as Stephen Greenblatt, but rather by looking in great depth at the context text, not marginal textuality as a new historicism, but at the rich, loamy context that gives rise to a reputation and show how it emerges, how it is shaped, and how it then radiates into ever wider spheres of public reputation and popular fame. So yes, 
because of my interest in cultural context, I think of myself today as a literary, cultural, and intellectual historian interested just as much in the history of ideas and intellectual history generated from my original interest in perception history as I am in the works themselves. How an author lives his life, what others come to say about it, how it is taken up by the media and other sources of reputation formation is an important area of interest to me. And I have adapted the work I've done on reputation on Orwell to study the reputations of many other authors among them, Friedrich Nietzsche, Isabel Allende, a Chilean author about whom I've written, published two different books, several of the leading New York intellectuals, the reputations of Lionel Trilling, Irving Howe, Dwight MacDonald, and so on. That is, I've attempted to talk about reputation beyond the case of Orwell, though often returning to him as an example of the complete, the richest instance that I've encountered of reputation from the critical through the popular sphere with so much available documentation I see reception history, and in particular what I refer to as reputation history, as a crucial aspect of cultural and intellectual history that should and will receive ever more attention as the decades pass. Reputation is what so much of what life is based on, all of advertising, the political credibility of candidates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Courses in sales and salesmanship, in leadership, all of these things will be studied in much more detail. And as I mentioned last time, we will have canons not just of books and authors, but canons of all of these other categories, as indeed we already do, though it's not typically recognized officially. We have scales and gradations of universities, of publishers, and on and on. Everyone knows who's on the inside, the status hierarchy. It's just that we have had our attention distracted and it's been veiled. Because to study reputation as a phenomenon risks reputations themselves, the sociology of knowledge. Once you begin to look at reputation more closely, you see that it is not automatically equated with merit, that reputation is a matter of perception, the perception of quality. And sometimes it's the emperor's new clothes things that are highly reputed may not be of the highest value. Uh, a moment ago you reflected on the use of the concept of portrait gallery in the politics of literary reputation. Uh, I happen to be very interested in portrait gallery, having done some work on portrait galleries in a very different context myself. And you also reflected on uh, perhaps the shift from the application of that kind of terminology in the politics of literary reputation to other metaphors, other paradigms in uh, the second study you devoted to Orwell's literary legacy. Uh, perhaps a related shift can be observed in the way in which you use the word literary hero quite a bit in the politics of literary reputation, whereas 
uh, in um, Scenes from an Afterlife and other books, you talk more about cultural icon. Is that indeed not a similar example of the way in which you are now using the concept of context in a more complete and perhaps, perhaps enriched way? Well, in the politics of literary reputation, I was very much concerned with Orwell the man mm -hmm. and reader's image of the man within the writings yeah. who has a literary voice that so resonates even today and constitutes one major source of Orwell's ongoing appeal. Mm -hmm. In the first book, The Politics of Literary Reputation, then, as I looked at different intellectuals who had lionized and exalted Orwell across the political spectrum, I noticed how often they had taken Orwell to heart personally and described him in heroic terms, mm -hmm. even using language such as my intellectual hero. That's a frequent phrase of Irving Howe. My literary hero, George Woodcock, John Wayne, and others. And on and on. That is, Orwell's personal presence in their lives as an enduring habitation and name was very much part of my interest in the politics of their reputation. People's fascination with and admiration for the life he lived, not just for the books he wrote. And one of my points was that the books alone cannot account for Orwell's quality of reputation. It's also a perception of the intellectual integrity of the man. Style is the man that somehow was manifested in the books. And that a knowledge of his life enhances our appreciation of the books because they are a seamless whole. He lived what he wrote. He wrote from the depths of his experience. In Scenes from an Afterlife, I refer to the icon Orwell, quote unquote. That is, there was Orwell the man, the author, the literary figure, and then there is Orwell in the quote marks. Orwell, not just the literary icon, but the ideological superweapon, the Orwellian specter, the talisman with which so many intellectuals and others have conjured and attempted to claim or counterclaim for their own purposes. It's this outside, outsized image of Orwell, the posthumous figure quite different from the man or the literary figure or even the voice in the works themselves that was so much a part of scenes from an afterlife. Orwell, some kind of object that is detachable from the work and the man and therefore quite susceptible to distortion and defacement. It's that kind of distinction that I want to draw between the heroic life that he lived, according to many intellectuals, and the object of controversy, the political football that he became in the decades following his death which bears only the loosest relationship to the man and the work in many respects. So Orwell becomes a commodity, not a natural resource, but a political resource, up for sale to the highest bidder, whoever can claim him, can use him. That is one of my points in the politics of literary reputation, that Orwell becomes not only the great critic of popular culture, but the object of popular culture 
commodified, turned into something from the speak rights in 1984. As a man, a writer, very often he goes down the memory hole. Mm -hmm. And in the widest public spheres, with the scare headlines, Orwellian, Orwell, he is something to be sold, purchased, traded, exploited for whatever interest group can make use of them. The devil will quote scripture to their purpose, and many ad men, as well as unscrupulous intellectuals, will quote Orwell to their purpose. So Orwell becomes, in the words of Smith, the protagonist of 1984, a palimpsest, a manuscript in the hands of the medieval mockers' pride. What text has been inscribed when it is no longer convenient or needed, but rubs it out and writes in another text? Yes. This is Winston Smith as the scribe at the Ministry of Truth. Orwell, a pamphlet says, on which so many write and rewrite and rewrite, or in the language of 1984, Orwell rectified the rectification of Orwell <laughs> so that he becomes a comrade Ogilvy, much like the figure whom Winston Smith is attempting to create in the Ministry of Truth. A figment that, here again, bears only the loosest relationship to historical fact. 